Okay, good evening. We're about ready to start the program. First, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Ramiro Salazar. I'm the director of the San Antonio Public Library, your director, library system. I want to extend to you a very warm welcome to your central library. Um, we're very excited to be offering this program this evening. And at this time, before I continue with the program, let, let me recognize a few individuals here. Uh, we have the chair of the library board, Jean Brady. We have uh, Laura Expert, also <laughs> member of the library board of trustees representing district six. And I see we also have uh, former president of the Landa Gardens Conservancy, uh, Ann Van Pelt, who is here. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> and we also have the president of the Friends of the San Antonio Public Library, who are celebrating their 50th year anniversary serving the San Antonio Public Library. Thank you, Linda, and thanks, thank you, Friends, for, for your support. Offering a program like the one we have this evening uh, requires the collective efforts of many. Uh, I would like to recognize the staff committee that worked very hard to put this program together. I would like to also thank the logistic team who worked on all the logistics to make this program uh, happen. So thank you, staff, for your support, for your efforts in uh, bringing this program uh, together and making a reality. I also want to thank the uh, Library Foundation San Antonio Public Library Foundation for their support, their sponsoring and hosting the reception after the program. They have been uh, great champions of the San Antonio Public Library. So I'd like to thank them and Tracy Bennett, who is the president and CEO of the Library Foundation. I also want to thank uh, Charlotte Ann Lucas and the team from Nowcast for uh, streaming this event, which will be streamed live. Those that will sign up to the work, uh, website in addition to that, we also made arrangements because we were expecting a standing only uh, crowd. We, we made the arrangements to stream this event and panel discussion in the Connect space here at the Central Library. Uh, one housekeeping item that I'd like to share with you. Uh, you may have noticed construction out in the foyer area. Uh, the bathrooms are under construction, but we do have bathrooms that are available, and I do want to take this time to publicly thank City Manager Carol Scully for her support in providing funds uh, to make a whole bunch of improvements here at the Central Library. The bathrooms here are only one of the many improvements that we're making. Uh, there are bathrooms and we have people outside, volunteers, we have teams that are volunteering to uh, guide people over to the other bathrooms that were just recently renovated and that are uh, in close proximity to Cafe Commerce. Talk about at another time, but it's a great project. Um, March is Women's History Month. Uh, it is a time to really celebrate uh, the contributions of women. And uh, I was really excited when I heard that the staff committee had talked or thought about this panel discussion and to invite influ influential women in the community to come together and to sit with us and to share with us uh, their path to leadership. And so we're extremely excited that we have uh, some women that have been extremely successful and have had a tremendous impact in this community, and they will be introduced shortly. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our panel moderator, Ms. Eileen, Eileen Pace. Eileen has been a news reporter with Texas Public Radio since 2010. Eileen joined the news department at KSTX San Antonio's uh, National Public Radio member station, covering a broad range of general assignment stories and the first reporter in the station's newly formed news department. Eileen was WOAI's first female news anchor, joining Bob Guthrie during Morning Drive for more than a decade. He's a veteran radio and print journalist with a long history of investigative and features reporting in San Antonio and Houston, earning awards for outstanding anchoring, investigating reporting, feature reporting, and sports reporting. We are truly honored to have her here with us this evening to moderate this panel discussion. Please send a warm welcome by Lee Page. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> All right, thank you, Ramiro. That was a nice introduction. I'm really excited to be here. This is such an important event. And we're so glad that all of you are here. The women that are joining us to speak this evening are truly pillars of our community and exemplify the national theme of Women's History Month, celebrating women of courage, character, and commitment. And I know many of you, and I know that to be totally true. Our first panelist is Janie Barrera, President and CEO of Axion Texas. Axion Texas, Inc. is a nonprofit agency that provides small loans and management training to micro enterprises of all kinds. As founding president and CEO, Barrera is responsible for the organization's financial management, oversight of its annual budget, and the development of methodology and loan delivery procedures. Janie, thank you. Our second panelist is Dr. Adina williams Lawson, president of St. Philip's College. Dr. Lawson has served as the 14th president of St. Philip's since 2007 and possesses more than 38 years of higher education experience. She was appointed to the president's advisory board for Title III administrators and is a member of the San Antonio Women's Hall of Fame, the boards of directors for the Alamo City Chamber of Commerce, SA 2020, and San Antonio for Growth on the East Side, also known as SAGE. Dr. Lawson, thank you for coming. <laughs> Next, we have Bear County Sheriff Susan Pomerlo, who became the first woman to be elected to Bear County Sheriff ever in 2012. Prior to being ele elected sheriff, she served 32 years in the Air Force, where she rose to the rank of Major General. After her retirement from the Air Force, she served as Senior Vice President at USAA, and she serves on the Board of Directors for Government Personal Personnel Mutual Life Insurance Company. Tara, thank you for coming. <laughs> Next, we have San Antonio City Manager Cheryl Scully. Scully began serving as City Manager in San Antonio in November of 2005. With more than 30 years of public management experience, under her financial leadership, the city's general obligation bond rating was upgraded by Standard & Poor's to AAA, a first for the city of San Antonio, quite an achievement. She has served on the San Antonio United Way Board of Directors since 2007 and was the 2013 United Way Campaign Chair, where she raised a record-setting $52.5 million for our community. Carol, thank you for coming. Our final panelist is Patricia Pilego Stout, CEO of the Alamo Travel Group, Inc. Since 1990, Alamo Travel has expanded to become a nationwide provider of corporate, leisure, federal, and state travel services. Stout has been featured in Latina Magazine, Reader's Digest, Hispanic Business Magazine, among others. She was included in the 100 Top Latinas of America in Hispanic Magazine in 2003. Stout is the current chair of the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and just put on a really big gala. <laughs> All right, I would like to, if I may, take a few minutes to allow each of our panelists to share some of their background with us. And in terms of um, your success, your ability to move into management, your desire to move into management, um, if you could share, each of you could share a little bit uh, about yourself with us, what attracted you to a position of leadership? And I'd like to thank uh, to start with uh, Ms. Barrera. Eileen. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. It sounds to me that um, when we celebrate we, have, we not only celebrate our, with ourselves, but we celebrate with everyone. So it's an honor for me to be here um, to share a little bit, not only about myself, but also of our work. And so Axion, as you know, is a micro and small business lender. Actually, I'm the first employee. Uh, 20 years ago, 1994, we opened up shop with two other, three of us did, actually. And um, now we are the largest micro lender in the United States. 
Micro lending, you know, is very prominent in developing countries, but not necessarily here in the United States. So for us to be able to become the largest meant we had to learn character of people, be able to mitigate risk. Because most of the people that we work with, the reason they can't get a loan is because they have bad credit. And so if I have bad credit, the person next to me has bad credit, why am I going to co-sign for one another, right? So what we're trying to do is level that financial playing field. So why would I want to be doing something like this? I have zero banking experience. I have an MBA, but never worked in a bank never actually worked for a financial institution. But my parents did have a Mexican restaurant in Corpus Christi, my first job for 20 years. Uh, my first job was as a uh, the waitress at the restaurant. And what I learned from those days watching my parents was that they were good at learning, having a restaurant. They were great cooks. They were great at customer service. They respected every single person that walked into that restaurant. What they were terrible at was finances. And so um, we didn't sit around the kitchen table talking about finances. We didn't talk about stock market. I didn't even know what a stock market was. I didn't realize that if you borrowed money and you paid it back on time, that actually helps your credit score. And so at the end of the 20 years, my parents retire with zero retirement, except for the $100,000 that they were getting from Social Security. So they ended up with nothing. That to them wasn't the big deal, though. But I thought, why? Because they had lived great lives, right? Rich lives. And so I thought, why, why can't we open up that financial playing field? Why can't we teach everybody? I used to think that you know, capitalism was terrible you know, in, in terms of being a socialist or a capitalist, you know, because I come from also a social service background. And so, um, so the fact that capitalism is a good thing, I think, because if you don't have a dollar, how can you then feed the hungry and shelter uh, folks that need housing or clothe the naked, right? People that need food, shelter, and clothes. You have to have a dollar to do those th things. And so by incorporating both the mission of being able to level the financial playing field with economic development in terms of financing, it's a great job to have. What we're doing is we're putting together the not-for-profit and the for-profit world together and be able to talk to the President of the United States one day, which I had the opportunity recently as being uh, asked to be on mission for financial capability, stand, sitting closer than I am to the front row here with the you know, person who is probably, the not probably, but the most powerful person in the world, and then coming home the next day and going to a little restaurant down on the south side and talking to the husband and wife who own that, probably net worth is you know, $25,000. So the, 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 the reality of being able to put these two worlds together and everyone is equal in that way, you know, you can always talk, we can have major conversations about ethnicity and gender and everything else, but at the end of the day, if you have a dollar, everybody's treated the same way. So if we can teach people how to A, handle dollars, how to handle my money, how to borrow money, pay it back on time, and be able to grow assets, I think that's very important. So in closing, I'd just like to say, you know, that saying, you give somebody a fish, they eat for a day. You teach somebody how to fish, they, they eat for a lifetime. What we do in our work is that we help people buy the pond where they fish. And so they're able to have assets and able to then to uh, have something, own something, to give it to the next generation, because I believe that's how we can break the cycle of poverty, is by owning something and giving it. So thank you, Eileen. Janie, thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Lawson, same question. What attracted you to a position of leadership? Hi. Uh, thank you very much. I must say, as, as a part of being selected to be a part of this panel, I'm, act I'm very honored and to be a part of this Women's History Month program. So thank you uh, to the members of the board and to the library and the administration for considering Adina Lawson to be worthy to be on this panel. Uh, we were asked to talk a little bit about ourselves and then why administration. I can tell you I grew up in Mississippi in the 50s. If you know anything about Mississippi in the 50s, my vision was as big as my big sister. Whatever she did, I wanted to do. What she majored in in college, I majored in. It was always following in my big sister's footsteps. So when she left home and went off to college, I was devastated because she left me. Growing up in Mississippi, it was the segregated South. 
We, I was not in an integrated environment until I went to graduate school. Because growing up in the South, the schools were segregated. When I went to college, went off to college, it was an historically black college, so that was not integrated. So it was not until I decided that I was going to work on my master's degree, uh, and I went to Ohio, and that was my first time being in an integrated environment. Uh, and deciding to work on my master's degree, as we talk about leadership, um, it was in the 11th grade. My aunt came to visit. She had just achieved her master's degree. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I wanted to be called master. So I decided <laughs> I was going to pursue. I didn't know. Uh, Lolo came by the house and said she just received her master's degree from LSU. Had no clue what it was, but I, I just remembered then I determined that I was going to be called master. And so I wanted to finish college in three years. This was laying in the top bunk bed in my, in my bedroom. I was going to finish college in three years and get a master's degree in one year. So by the time everybody else was getting their bachelor's degree, I would already be master. Uh, going to school in Mississippi and growing up in the South, the, um, as you remember, the Freedom Riders coming down South, having sit-ins and establishing the Freedom Schools, I attended those Freedom Schools. Uh, every summer when they would come. So, and then going off to work, every job I have ever held throughout my entire professional career, I was the first black or the only black. So leadership, being in a leadership position was truly not a vision that I had, nor did I have a role model for that growing up in Mississippi. But it wasn't until I selected a job. I was at Arkansas State University, the first African-American female hired, uh, instructional female hired there. And they were pushing me to go back to get a PhD. If you're going to teach at a university, you need to have a PhD. So that was the push. Uh, and when I went back to work on my PhD, the instructor there, Ronald Jones, when I learned he had been a college president, the light bulb came on, and I said, if he can do it, certainly I can do it, <laughs> Dr. Ronald Jones. But throughout my entire professional career, as I've said, every place I've ever worked, I was the first black or the only black, even going to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. I was the highest ranking African American female in the agency. Uh, it is not until I came to San Antonio, Texas, that I followed another African American leader. So my journey over 40 years has been long. It's been trailblazing. Uh, but to move into the position of leadership, I understood and learned quickly that leaders set the agenda. And you have an opportunity to make a difference, a meaningful difference in the lives of others. My goal has been, since being in a leadership position, to ensure that there is opportunities for inclusiveness Everyone is present at the table in the decision-making processes. And to know that you set the strategic agenda, and with that comes great responsibility, but I do own that. So it's been more or less just knowing that I can make a meaningful difference. And so that has been uh, the reasons why I have chosen to be in this leadership position. Thank you. Dr. Lawson, thank you. Probably better being called doctor than even being called master. Right? I got that too, finally, <laughs> after Ronald Jones. <laughs> Sheriff Pomerlo, we'd ask you the same thing. What attracted you to, your, your, to a position of leadership? You know, the, uh, I think all of us have something in common. Is, this is echoing. Is that okay? Pretty loud, but it's yeah. okay. Okay, let me back off. No, no, no. <laughs> But I think uh, there are some common themes here, and I too am honored to be a part of this panel as uh, I look down this table. Uh, these are great women, uh, and so I'm really um, humbled to be part of this group. But I, in what Dr. Lawson said, you got to know that uh, she can wear the T-shirt that says, I'm a rocket scientist. <laughs> And similar, I didn't grow up in the South, but I'm a preacher's kid, and I grew up about the same time. And so when I was a senior at the University of Wyoming, and I'm getting a degree in sociology, I'm thinking, 
I don't think so. And the Air Force recruiter came along. What I didn't know at the time was that about the same time she came to visit my sorority, the National Defense Authorization Act of 1968 was just being passed by the Congress, and in it, there were two provisions that were being repealed. U.S. Code Title 10, Section 625, which said, women may not rise above the rank of lieutenant colonel or Navy commander, and women may not comprise more than 2% of the armed forces. Those rules had been in place since 1947 at the end of World War II and when the new uh, when the War Department was morphed into the Department of Defense, the Air Force was established. Because men were coming back from war, they needed jobs, and so there were limitations on how many women could serve in the armed forces. They were going back to the traditional roles of being mothers, housemakers, teachers, nurses, those types of things. So I entered the Air Force at a time when there was great social change, it was at the height of the Vietnam War, and so a lot of things were changing. And so through the 70s, one the Equal Rights Amendment was being debated uh, across the nation. And a lot of other things were changing in the workplace. So when I entered the Air Force in 1968, there were 2,000 officer trainees at officer training school right across town at Lackland Air Force Base. They had doubled the number of women who came into officer training school in that class. From 20 to 40, the odds were great. And so, like Dr. Lawson, she was the only black woman uh, in the jobs that she was in, or the first one, Every assignment I had for the next 10, 12 years, I was either the most senior woman officer or I was the only woman officer. And so working in a traditionally man's environment is nothing new. It's sort of like this is the way it's always been. So here's what I would say about um, being in a leadership position. I never really thought about being in a leadership position, but I was fortunate enough to be in an organization that valued professional development. It valued education. It valued hard work. It valued having a focus on something larger than yourself. And growing up as a preacher's kid, I would say that I started off with a great foundation of service, commitment, helping others who are not as fortunate as you are, and just had you know, a great foundation across the board. Now you say, why would I want to be the sheriff of Bear County, the uh, chief law enforcement officer of the based on Texas law. And again, after having two successful careers in the military, in the corporate environment, why would I want to be in law enforcement? Why would I run for sheriff? I've never been in law enforcement before. But it was looking at what the real job of the sheriff of Bear County is. And that's one of leading a very large organization managing a very large budget, focusing on a very specific mission, and making sure that we provide those who are serving in the Bear County Sheriff's Office the tools that they need to provide for public safety. And so when I looked at what kinds of experiences I had, what kinds of skills that I could bring, and after uh, being recruited to run for a county commissioner position and not winning, I was so inspired by grassroots people who care deeply about their community, and I thought, I chose San Antonio, and Bear County is my home, so why shouldn't I be involved? And I think that's an important 
uh, lesson there is we all have a responsibility to our community to use our skills, our talents, to make it a better place to live and work. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Ms. Scully, can you also share a little about, about yourself and what attracted you to a position of leadership? Uh, happy to. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Thank you all for being here. And I thank the panel members as well. I'm happy to share uh, the panel with you. Well, I wasn't born a city manager, uh, but I, I was born the oldest of uh, seven children. And so I've been somewhat in a leadership role uh, for much of my life. My sisters might describe it slightly differently. <laughs> but I was the older sister and uh, had a strong foundation of my family as well. My parents uh, raised seven children, all, all of which went to college and graduated and uh, have very different kinds of careers, but they stressed the importance of education. It was a working class family. My mom stayed at home in a very traditional role back in the 50s and 60s. And uh, I was told that if I did well in school, I'd be able to go to college. And so I had to work very hard to earn a college degree and uh, grew up in Northwest Indiana, just outside of Chicago, and uh, was able to earn a journalism scholarship to Ball State University and majored in journalism and political science and became very interested in local government. Now, my father had been a Democratic precinct committeeman as I was growing up, and they, both of my parents volunteered in school and at the church. And so I grew up in an environment of public service and volunteerism, and uh, also was told by my parents that I had to do well because there were six others following me, and if I did something that wasn't quite right, the rest of the family would be labeled, and those kids would have a hard time in school, and so I had a huge responsibility. But as I graduated from school and took my first job out of college uh, working with the city of Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, doing some research writing for them on a project, and uh, became enamored with the work and knew that I wanted to work in public service. And I can't, I was thinking as each one of us has said, we've been the first woman in every position um, over my career, but for San Antonio. So I don't know if it's Things are starting to change, although I've been in this business. This year will be my 40th year in uh, city management and public service. Uh, but it's been slow to change, and I think there are still many, many things that we need to work on, uh, men and women in the community, to support women and their roles in their careers. But uh, throughout my career. I've worked in Michigan uh, for 15 years. I started in an entry-level position and moved up to the city manager's office working on projects and progressed in that organization and competed for the city manager's position there at age 32. Uh, competed with an older man who was in his late 50s and on a split vote the city council appointed me city manager and uh, what in the world did I know about that? But they saw promise in me. But I have to share with you that throughout my career, and even in those first 10 years, um, as I said and stated what I really wanted to do in, in local government and what positions I was aspiring to, both men and women told me that boy, I was setting my goals way too high, that there was no way that city would ever hire a female city manager. I think back on that now and wouldn't dream of telling a staff member that they couldn't achieve their, their goals and what they wanted to do. But I'm looking out and seeing a number of city staff in the audience and those who have worked with me know all, all you have to say to me is you can't do it and that makes me work even 10 <laughs> times harder. Uh, and so we worked pretty hard. We worked very hard and I would say hard work, passion for the work that we do, uh, courage to do the things that we think we cannot do, reflecting on Eleanor Roosevelt who said 
that so many times, do the thing that you think you cannot do, um, and having the courage to do the thing that is right. If it's right for you, uh, if it's right for the organization, if it's, it's right for the community. And so um, I worked in Michigan for 15 years and was recruited to Phoenix. I'd never been to the Southwest. I'd never even been to Phoenix. Wasn't quite enamored with it the first time I saw uh, the city, but ended up moving there and taking the risk. My husband quit his job. Our children were preschoolers and uh, took that opportunity and was the first female there, which to me seemed pretty hard to believe in that day and age. Nonetheless, was able to excel and work on projects that uh, were able to establish me in, in that organization and in that community as being a risk taker and someone that would take on the hard duties and responsibilities and some of those toughest things to do. I think as women, sometimes, and I'll say this, you know, we almost in growing up in the time frame, since we're all in similar time frames, maybe I'm the oldest one here, but <laughs> we, won't, we won't talk about age, but, uh, you know, we're expected, we're expected to be so much better than anyone else. And, you know, we used to say that equality will happen when you can be <coughs> mediocre at your job and still be okay because uh, there were so many mediocre men at the time that we would say, oh my gosh, I, could, I can do that. I can do that better. I have some other ideas. Together we can even make the organization greater if we, if we partner. But uh, it, it motivated me to do even more to take on those greater challenges. And so when the opportunity came to come to San Antonio, what a wonderful city, what a great opportunity to be a CEO again. And uh, that was nine years ago, which is hard to believe, but we've covered a lot of territory and made, um, we think, a lot of change and improvement. And I'll just say that not only within the city organization, but as a community working together, and I've been a United Way volunteer for my entire adult life, and it's important not just to work at the work that we do, but to make sure that we are, as has been said, involved in the community and contributing our talents uh, in a variety of ways. Tomorrow morning I'll be with my reading buddy at Bonham Elementary early in the morning. Uh, and just knowing that one little girl that I'm helping as a second grader with her reading skills perhaps will motivate her to take an interest in a particular subject or become an avid reader and excel in her education so that she has an opportunity to do the best and be the very best that she can be. So uh, a career of public service that I'm motivated to do because it is about serving others. It is about bringing greatest value to those who are paying the bill, to the taxpayers of the community, making sure that we're providing the very best that we can with the resources we have available and presenting the community with options on how we can be better. And that, that does motivate me and excites me uh, to do an even better job each and every day. Thank you, Cheryl. And finally, Ms. Stout, would you be able to share a little bit of yourself with us and tell us what motivated you to become a leader? Well, it was not in my plans, and you will you'll see why. First of all, I was born in Mexico City many years ago. When little girls were not expected to do anything else to get married, and so I was raised that way, Catholic environment. I was the first granddaughter, the first daughter, so I was uh, really, you know, very, thought very special. And uh, I, I intended to go to college and I had a big fight with my, my father because he thought it was a waste of time because I was expected to get married in two years. But I managed to go to the University of Mexico and then we had some riots and then my father said, you're not going there because, you know, you could get killed and things were really, really bad in 1968. So um, I agreed. So I decided, he said, just go and I'll pay for whatever. Um, education you may want, you know, take. So I decided to go for languages, which 
really opened my world to learn almost anything I wanted to learn. I learned French, I learned English, I learned Italian, then I went on and took other different courses. And in the meantime, um, I was not allowed to work because that was not, you know, something that it was agreeable. Uh, so but they let me work for a man who was a friend of the family, and that changed my life. This man passed, he's from Monterrey, and it's a man of great relevance, and maybe you know the company is Molinos Azteca. They make, uh, you know, dough for tortillas, and they, it's one of the largest manufacturer of tortillas in the world. They, the man owned uh, Banco, I don't remember exactly, Nor Banco del Norte and other companies. So when I started working for this man, I realized that he was the most outstanding person in, in the world of, of his company, of his building, when he would walk in would recognize, recognize him. For me, he knew everything. He, he had answers for everything. He would bring deals. He would just grow the company so fast. And then I knew that I wanted to. My father was an entrepreneur. My grandfather was an entrepreneur. And I thought that it was the easiest thing. But then I got involved with my other future that my family had prepared for me. And then I got involved in getting myself ready to get married, which did not happen. And uh, so I forgot about all of that. Nevertheless, I continued studying. So my fracture education was something that I chose by design. I found something very, very interesting. When you are attracted to a certain uh, learning, possibility you learn so fast, you become expert. And I started to look at numbers, and then I uh, started doing accounting, and then I became the manager of that company. And then later, I went to another company where I met my ex-husband, and we moved to the US. I arrived here, it's going to be 41 years. Um, arrived with my ex-husband and myself and my pet, and we had the plan to open a, a branch of his father's construction company, which we did, and we was it was re very relevant. We made a lot of money. I managed the books, and he managed the ideas, and we were the best pair. Therefore, we made a lot of money, and therefore, the marri marriage went sour. So, <laughs> <laughs> there was too much, oops. I didn't touch it. There was too much money and too much freedom. I had my two babies. I had pool, jacuzzi. I was living the, the American dream, not looking back or anything of the sort. And then we, we got involved in, in a franchise for travel agencies that I didn't approve of, but it was done. And then our marriage collapsed. And I ended up with a one-person travel agency that I accepted as part of my divorce uh, agreement. And um, the reason I, why I accepted a lesser deal, which was not good at the time, was because I saw that this will be my passport for my independence, a woman, somebody who could take care of her children, that I, for the first time in my life, I was going to be the master of my because I've always lived at home with parents. I always lived with my husband. And I had a happy marriage for, for a while. But um, I found that I had never been on my own. And that was frightening. Because I didn't know I was capable. I was going to be strong enough to do this in a foreign country. Divorce. Two kids. And at the time, Jamie, you did not exist in my life. <laughs> there were no loans for minority women owned. We're talking 1980. It was very difficult. I didn't have a college degree. 
I have two kids. I had a fabulous home. And pretty soon, not to have child support or anything else. I didn't know that was in the pipeline, as many women don't know. And they trust that when they get divorced, that there's going to be a moral responsibility from both parties. But sometimes it doesn't happen. It didn't happen to me. But I think that that was the catalyst that made me find help. I decided to continue with the business and grow it, develop it with my credit card. Because nobody would lend any money to a Latina, just divorced, you know, in, with a new business. And so I decided to use my Visa card at the time. So SoloServe was my best friend, and you know, <laughs> the coupons at the grocery store, I had them all in alphabetical order perfectly. Uh, the good thing is when you have money, you buy too many clothes. So I didn't have to buy clothes for two or three years. I had shoes forever. And so pets, I had the whole package. And now I had to deal with this package because I promised myself that I was not going to ask for money from my family or I was going to ask for, you know, any... I was... In, my, in Mexico, you don't ask for the government to help you. So you just make it happen. So I work as hard as I could. But I found mentors along the way. I find people who told me, no, you're going very slowly. Join uh, this, this uh, nonprofit, do, etc." So I joined all the chambers. I could not afford it, but I put on the credit card. So anyway, I started going to all these meetings. And one day, the city of San Antonio, Economic Development, along with the Hispanic Chamber, had a meeting with small business to teach them how to do business with government. And it was like, you were talking to me. I was like in a trance, believing absolutely everything they told me. You, um, government contractor, because there's two billion, et cetera, minorities when known in small business. And I totally, and I'm glad I did, because I was able to be trained by some experts at the city. I had mentors from the chamber. Ramiro Cavazos, who is the president, president nowadays was the president then, and we had a little chamber with very few people, with one staffer, and that's why I'm the chairman of the Hispanic Chamber, because all these years I had that gratitude, and I'm paying back now. But um, I was able to get my first contract in 1994 for $4 million with the GSA with the help of all these people, because I realized that I was an excellent salesperson and everybody believed me. I've never done this before, but I was like, yes, it's me, and I'm going to do it. And I knew that in this country, if you work hard, you persist, and you don't let anybody you know, tell you that you cannot do it. You can do it. And I was so impressed with the fact that being a woman, it really didn't matter that much. You work hard, the results were going to be there. And it happened. One contract, started hiring other people. I am very in touch with the needs of single parents, both men and women. And it looked like my, my company, my type of business attracted that type of group. So we understood each other. We knew. Sometimes we had to leave to go pick up the children, et cetera. My company kept growing. Then we went in from state to federal. Um, and then I became the largest Latino businesswoman owner that was working with government contracts. And I was at the right time, at the right place, for the wrong reason, unfortunately. But this is when the war really exploded. And my company multiplied one time, the first time, 600% from one, one quarter to another. And the, the growth was a little bit unsustainable at times because we had to work a lot of overtime. But I never forgot to be very grateful about the work because that work brought a lot of good things for the families that depended on me. But then I realized that Without planning, I had become a leader, and that people follow me. So I thought that this is an opportunity for mentoring and working for others, for my employees, for my community, 
So I had tried to serve different capacities and boards to be able to pass on a passion that I still have in my heart for a small business or for business, but more than anything else to tell aspiring entrepreneurs, both men and women, que si se puede, yes, you can do it. Because if someone like me has made it so well in this country, anybody can. It all it takes is learn, work hard, persist, never give up, and know that it's going to happen. I mean, it just, it's impossible that it would not happen. Because I have seen it many times. I have seen it with other women. Today, I'm just so proud and honored to sit here and listen to the stories. Because I am here in front of great talent, great intelligence, dedication. And all of us, at the same time, have been mothers, grandmothers. And we keep going like the little rabbit, I think. But we're going to be go keep going because we have so much to give, so much to offer. And we want to mentor, and we want to share. And so that's, thank you. Well, we have a list of questions here. Some of you have already touched on many of these things, but maybe we can just kind of um, go into a little bit more about the greatest influences that have marked milestones for you along your path. And maybe tell us why you do what you do. Um, Janie, can I call on you? Well, there have been many influ uh, people that, of influence in my life, um, and most of them have been women. Um, if, talking about the entrepreneurial spirit, my grandmother in Laredo, Texas, owned a little grocery store for the neighborhood. And so mom would let me go and spend a couple of weeks with her. That's where I learned how to sell stuff, be good customer service. Obviously, my mom was a great influence on me as well. Um, and I don't know if uh, part of my bio and my background is, as well is that at 18, I entered the convent. So for 15 years, I was an incarnate sister. So the leadership there uh, taught me many things as well. So Sister um, Bridget O'Neill was my novice directress. What she told me was, don't ever put yourself in a corner that you don't have enough room to turn around in. And I thought that was great advice. So if you do get yourself stuck in a corner, turn around and everything opens up. So as you go, so as I do that training in terms of discipline, in terms of community, in terms of social uh, service, social work, I learned then to listen. And I think that's one of the great traits of a leader, needs to listen, and to then be able to do something about it. Listening to for listening is not good enough. But how do you connect the dots, right? How do you connect the dots of what you hear to what the potential is out there? So people of influence in terms of what the people that I surround myself with also are people that are smarter than I am and complement the things that I do. So as first employee of Oxion, Texas, 20 years ago, remember I have no banking experience. Guess who was the first person I hired? Banker, right. So um, since that time, I also have been blessed to be surrounded with many people who get the kind of work that we uh, are doing. And so, you know, here I am, my 30s in San Antonio. I don't know anybody, but Al Martinez Fonts was the chairman of the Greater Chamber that year here in San Antonio. He was also the president of Chase Bank. So what did Al do? He, he introduced me to all the bankers. San Antonio, because he had the credibility. So when he opens the doors, I can say they, he vouched for me. So then people like um, Frost, Pat Frost, and so on, um, were listening because of Al's credibility. And as time goes on, to be able to fill positions within even our organization that are also complementary to what um, my skill sets are. So as you, as the question is, you know, who has been influenced? Well, there are people that are. Um, that gravitate to this kind of work, I think, would be a way of saying it. And the other lessons learned is I stay away from people that don't get what we do. Life is too short, and I'm not going to spend time with folks that have bad energy or bring things that say, you can't do it. I'm like our city manager, Cheryl, I say, really? When people say, you can't do it? OK, let's see, how can we do it? And that I learned from my dad. Because, you know, he would say, um, if there's a door that's closed, it's locked, 
there's another way around the house. So it's, you know, it's, so it's this, where there's a will, there's a way, right? So um, uh, that has been part of the, my history of people coming into, uh, into my life at a certain time when it's just, it's, I don't call it coincidence, I call it providence. Because uh, things don't happen just because, things happen for a reason. So for some reason, you're here tonight listening to all these old ladies talk. <laughs> I wonder if we could open it up to a discussion about that. We have um, a couple of minutes for each person to talk, but I think it might be more fun to just share. What do y'all think? <laughs> Who has something to say about that, about the greatest influences along your path? So with one simple one. Um, I think that when you're young or a child, pretty much you get, in my case at least, was programmed by family. Um, my grandmother called me one day, I probably was nine, and, and she told me, I have noticed that you're pretty good with numbers. I know that you can do, you know, etc. I know that you've been saving your money, so I'm going to teach you how to take care of money, because you are going to have a lot of money, but you need to know how to utilize it properly. So my grandmother was the, she had five children and she handled all the money for, for the, uh, the, the house uh, expenses and she spent every afternoon showing me what to pay this, how to pay that, how much money was coming in. And she told me, if you learn how to do this, you will always be successful. And to this day, that's where I have a passion for. I love to count money. I love it. <laughs> and not only that, I spend it, invest it very, 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 in a, in a very conservative way. So I think of my grandmother almost every night. And I thank her. Because one thing that you just said, Janie, a lot. I, I have had four businesses, and when I go with a partner, I tell them, as long as I sign the check, <laughs> I will partner with you, or with a man or woman. The, the problem is, is that the back office in small businesses and in large companies or cities, sometimes is not managed properly, and that's where bad things happen. And I'm telling you that if you know how to manage your income, you're going to be successful family, your business. So I think of my grandmother because she told me that I could do it. I, I was just adding cents and pesos or etc. But that was the beginning. And I had other influences, but that, that statement from her still lives inside me. And I've always been very, very careful with money. And I tend to make it grow just because I am careful, and I, I try to expand into that and tell people, watch your money, watch your back office, and you will be happy and sleep quite well. So for me, my grandmother was the greatest lady on earth and allowed me to be a very good businesswoman. Dr. Lawson? Yes, thank you. Listening to that comment, I, I want to add to, in terms of my greatest influencers, were my parents. My father believed in Booker T. Washington, so he mandated that all of his children would have a skill or a trade, something that you could do with your hands, because he would say, a black person is fired from a job every day, but no one can ever take away a skill or a trade. So starting even in the fourth grade, I learned how to sew. My mother believed in William Edward Barnhart Du Bois. Everybody had to have a college degree. So there are five of us. We all have a trade, and we all have a college degree. Daddy being, he only finished the sixth grade, but he ultimately went back to school to get his plumber's license at Alcorn State University. He was the first uh, black self-employed plumber in Vicksburg, Mississippi. So he had a great deal of plumbing business. My father charged people according to the way they talked to his children. 
<laughs> Many people called daddy for business. And in Mississippi, we were in the N-word. And we were many different ways of the N-word with different adjectives and adverbs. Our charge for daddy was always you had to write down exactly what the person called you or said to you. And daddy would always take the child that took the message. And when he called the person back, or if he, they didn't have a phone and he had to go to their home, he would take that child and he would always say, I have a special price just for you. <laughs> so depending upon how many different ways you were called a nigger, you had to pay more and the child was standing there because daddy would always say, never turn away or never hang up. You don't turn away business. So he would charge people according to the way they talked to his children. If people were very nice to us, That's innovation. <laughs> people were very nice to us, daddy would take us and sometimes he would do the plumbing work and then say no charge. People never understood. But when he said, I have a special price for you, and daddy was jacking the price up, people were smiling and happy. <laughs> and so that, that was the way we learned to negotiate our negotiation skills, doing business. We never turned business away. And both my parents were great influencers, but I've learned the influence of Artemisia Bowden, our founding president at St. Philip's College. She was there for 52 years. I'm still learning and still growing. She was the president. And then when we formed the Alamo Union School District, she was stripped of her title as president, and she was given the title of dean. But she continued to lead. For 52 years, the mission was greater than her title. I'm still learning. And I can say that that's, uh, I enjoy doing what I I believe I'm doing what I'm called to do, and I enjoy it. That's why I That's do it. That's a great story. That's great. Thank you. Sarah? You know, I think often um, in our work life or in, when there are opportunities, barriers are thrown at us. But I think it's important to look at barriers not as obstacles and not as a bad thing. Because certainly in the business I'm in now, we put up barriers to protect people. Like when there are uh, flooding and uh, uh, overwhelming rain, and we put up barriers to keep people from drowning or losing their car. And so those are good things. There are also barriers, I think, that uh, when we're so impatient that we want to do that next thing, Sometimes holding us up a little bit helps us to develop, mature, and learn more about what it is that we're doing so that when that opportunity comes up again, then we're ready for it. We've thought about it. We've trained for it. We've gotten enough experience that we make better decisions when we get to that. The other thing is there are barriers that are cultural. Certainly, if I had given up and thought that, uh, well, I'm not going to stay in the Air Force because, well, they encouraged me to get out when I got married. And if I, had a, if I got pregnant, I was out in a matter of days. Well, those things change. And sometimes it's being patient with what the barriers are because things do change, policies opportunities change. Certainly when I came in, there were, women were mostly in administration, personnel, communications. They were not astronauts, pilots, uh, doctors, lawyers, um, aircraft maintenance officers, four-star generals, and all of those barriers have been broken because women stuck with it. They had a dream. They had a vision of what they wanted to be, what they could become, and they pursued it. So recently, uh, I had an opportunity uh, in January while I was in Washington, D.C., to 
here the new director of the FBI. He's only been in office for a very short time. But in a video that he provided to 37,000 uh, employees of the FBI, he said, here's what I expect of you. And there are probably three or four of these five things that he said that have resonated with me. And I thought, you know, that's about the best advice that you can give anybody. Work hard, because the work we do is valuable and makes a difference. Find joy in the work that you do, especially when it comes to law enforcement. It's because there's moral content in what we do. Find a balance between family work life, because the joy of a two-year-old running up to you when you open the door and come home, you shouldn't miss that, because you can never go back and recover. And four, have a balance in your work life, your spiritual life, your physical fitness, and your family, because all of those are things that will Sustain you when it's really tough, when they're tough, really, when the times are really tough. And then one bit of advice that one of uh, one of my bosses was one of those who saw a spark in me and gave me some opportunity, and that was to fail or to succeed. And it was my choice as to what I did. He said, "Bite off more than you." Chew, and chew it. <laughs> I like that. Well, quickly, the only thing to add, uh, my parents also were the greatest influence in my life and told me that I could be the very best and was the best. And it was probably well into my 20s before I realized, oh my gosh, I'm not the best at this. Uh, but they encouraged me to be the best, that I had the capability and said, and now you also have the responsibility to use those talents and to be the very best that you can be. There were also a couple of professors that encouraged me and pulled me aside to give me a chance to fail and to also do well, and a couple of bosses over the years. And I've never forgotten them because they not only gave me opportunities to excel and use my talents, but to step outside of my comfort zone. Early in my career, I made a conscious decision because we all started, I think, in the time frame where women were identified to do certain kinds of work. And I always chose something else, where it was only men doing that. And in the city management profession, when I was first appointed a city manager back in the mid-'80s, there were only five female city managers in the country in cities of greater than 50,000 in population. So it was almost all white men back then in that time. And they were all engineers who'd been public works directors. So you can imagine having women in that environment was so different. But eating to the, the words of my parents and to those who were guiding me, were mentors to me, that I could be anything that I wanted to be and had a responsibility to be the very best at it was so important in words that really encouraged me along the way. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> Amita, would you like to come back up? We're kind of getting close to our time to get out. I don't think we have time for another round, but. Maybe you have questions, or you want to talk a little bit about Women's History Month. First of all, thank you, Eileen. First of all, I want to um, ask the audience for another big round of applause for our panelists. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, panelists, for being part of uh, our program this evening. It's important uh, 
for the library to continue to offer programs that provide an opportunity for our members of the com community to be enlightened, uh, whether it be about individuals that have succeeded in spite of obstacles in their professional work, uh, or any of the other programs that the library provides that uh, bring, again, attention to important matters to the community uh, for people to allow them to make smart decisions. Tonight's program is a program to recognize the contributions of women, and we're very pleased that we have five women, very influential women, that continue to contribute to this community in big ways, and we're honored and privileged to have you part of our program. So thank you again for participating. And Eileen, I want to thank you for uh, accepting our invitation to moderate this program. Uh, thank you so much. You did a great job. Uh, we would like to present each of the pan panelists with a copy of Chihuly by Donald B. Cuspid as a token of our appreciation. You know, we're very fond of Chihuly. We have a great piece here. Um, who um, The piece draws many visitors to the Central Library and it inspires also our visitors, and I, I think you will be inspired by this copy of the book. We have asked uh, the teens from the John Nigel Branch Library, who are part of the Teen Leadership Council, uh, to make those presentations to you. Uh, they will be coming out shortly. Here they come. We also have for you a certificate, a certificate of recognition for uh, being a member of this panel and b being a woman of influence. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you, teens, and thank you also for your work at the John Igo Branch Library. I would, I would like to also, in closing, thank Nowcast for screening this event. Uh, we do have a reception sponsored by the San Antonio Public Library Foundation in the gallery, so I will, would like to invite all of you to stay and join us in our refreshments. Thank you again, all of you, for being part of the program, for coming, and uh, thank you again. <laughs>